you all have probably heard this number. One in eight women in this country will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and we always like to focus on this topic. I'm so glad that Dr. Vanthana Abramson could come in and talk about this with us. She is um, an oncologist at Vanderbilt and we're so happy to have you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's talk about what is breast cancer? That's a great question. So breast cancer or any cancer in general is basically a cell that won't stop growing. So normal cells in your body generally have a check. They know that they're supposed to stop growing at a certain point or they kill themselves off. Mm -hmm. Cancer cells find a way around that. They keep growing and growing and growing and eventually they, they metastasize or go to other parts of the body and sort of wreak havoc. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what cancer is, is basically a cell that just won't stop growing and why that happens is highly variable. In mm -hmm. some people, we, we know they're genetic factors. In others, it's, it's just unknown. So that's what we're trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. That leads right into the next question. Who is most likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer? Oftentimes we hear if, you, if your mother, if your aunt, a, a sibling, someone mm -hmm. very close to you has had breast cancer, you are definitely at higher risk. Uh, but then oftentimes it comes on someone who has no family history, isn't absolutely. that true? That is absolutely true. So it turns out, first of all, being a woman, of course, makes it puts you at a higher risk mm -hmm. of developing breast cancer. Only 1% of cases of breast cancer are in men. Increasing age increases the risk of breast cancer. Um, other than that, there are some genetic factors. So about five to 10% of people who are diagnosed with breast cancer do have a known gene genetic mutation, such as a mutation in what's called the BRCA or BRCA1 or 2 mm -hmm. gene. In others, it's just environmental factors that may be playing a role. But I will say the vast majority of people do not have a family history. They have no re really identifiable risk factor for breast cancer. That's what's so frightening. You know, when, it, when there's not even a risk factor, that, that you're aware of. Um, and are most of these cancers diagnosed during a self-exam or during a mammogram? Mammograms uh, actually pick up the vast majority of these early stage breast cancers. They also, um, a lot of people come in having palpated a, a mass on their own or they're found to have a mass on an annual exam. Um, but mammography is a great screening tool. Okay, so we hear healthy living tips all the time, exercise, eat well. Are there, are these really going to have an impact as far as reducing your risk of breast cancer? They really do. So it turns out obesity, which is um, a body mass index of over 30, can increase your risk of breast cancer two and a half times. And exercise, uh, moderate exercise over three hours a week can decrease your risk of breast cancer by half, which is really significant. Mm -hmm. um, other, other things like alcohol intake. So alcohol can increase your risk of, of breast cancer significantly. One drink per day can increase your risk by 12%. So we usually tell that's a scary statistic. That is a scary statistic. So we tell people to limit their alcohol intake to at most two to three drinks per week, at okay. the very most. Okay. Now I know that you are a specialist in this area in breast cancer research, as well as clinical trials. You often hear of people who uh, go into clinical trials when nothing else is working. I want to know about any progress being made in the treatment of breast cancer in the trials you're currently working on at Vanderbilt. Yes, absolutely. So. First of all, I just want to start out by saying that we've had five new breast cancer drugs approved in the last two to three years, which is That remarkable. many. That many. So a lot of prog progress is being made, and that's through clinical trials. Mm -hmm. At Vanderbilt, we're working on a lot of uh, different clinical trials. One I'd like to highlight is with immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. So immunotherapy is basically, uh, this is a class of drugs that revs up your own immune system to attack cancer cells. We know that immunotherapy works in breast cancer, but we really don't know who the best person is to get immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure this out at this point. So we have clinical trials in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, in ca breast cancers that are not fed by hormones, different types of breast cancers, and looking at Im immunotherapy and who responds, who does not respond. And if they don't respond, why are they not responding? Let me ask you about this. If you're doing the immunotherapy, would you still be doing chemotherapy in treatment? In some of the clinical trials, yes. And we are still trying to figure out whether it's best to combine it with chemotherapy or to give it sequentially. And that's one of the questions we're actually asking. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. We didn't discuss that before, no, but I was just thinking about that. And, and, and you, it seems like we're seeing more and more reporting on using less 
chemotherapy in treating some of these cancers. Are you seeing that? Absolutely, yes, and that is personalized medicine. We're trying to figure out exactly what is driving a cancer, what's making it grow, and attacking it in that way. Chemotherapy basically just kills cancer cells mm -hmm. haphazardly, and it attacks normal cells, which is why you get so many of the side effects of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. But now we're moving more and more towards targeted therapy, and that's what many of our own clinical trials are, are um, addressing. So there is reason to have hope. We there, always need to have hope. There is so much reason to have hope, especially right now. So first of all, about 85% of breast cancers that are diagnosed are going to be cured. We need to bring that up to 100% and we're getting there. We're getting there very, I think very quickly. We have so many different clinical trials um, on the docket and uh, people who want to participate. And mm -hmm. I also want to emphasize that clinical trials are not just for people who don't have other options. We have clinical trials for people who've just been diagnosed, who have just been diagnosed with metastatic disease. So mm -hmm. we have um, clinical trials that can address the needs of many different people. You've made great strides. Yes. And with the new drugs you mentioned too, uh, can you tell me the names of those drugs? Just uh, the, the new yes, ones the that new have been. Ones. Yes, so uh, palbocyclib is one, ribocyclib is another, neratinib, olaparib, and abemocyclib. All right, well, we are so fortunate to have people like you who dedicate their lives to this research and are making a difference, really. Thank you. I hope it continues, continued uh, good luck thank with you. your studies, and thank you so much for coming in, Dr. Abramson. Thank you so much for having me. We really appreciate it. And thank you for watching Community Health Matters. Learn more ways to improve your health on our website, mycommunityhealthmatters.org. And remember, here in Middle Tennessee, our community health matters.